Great. Uh, so I uh, would like to welcome you to our second Newland series program of this uh, this season. Uh, my name's Laura. I am the programs manager um, at Newland Gristmill. Uh, if you're not familiar with Newland, uh, we're a privately run nonprofit park in Delaware County, uh, Pennsylvania, and we are on the West Bridge of Chester Creek, uh, which will be important for this talk. Uh, the site includes 160 acres of land over eight miles of trails uh, and a historic area with our uh, historic 1704 gristmill at its center um, and the newland series uh, of programs is a way for us to explore some of the topics that relate to our dual mission of history and nature um, and feature both outside experts uh, like today uh, and also newland gristmill staff uh, at times uh, this year the programs are sponsored by team toyota of glenn mills so we do for that. Uh, if you have uh, questions for during the talk, um, just hold, try to hold them till the end, or uh, if you Fred, you forget, feel free to drop them in the chat, and then we'll have a question and answer session um, afterwards. Uh, so today's talk uh, focuses on more of the environmental side of our mission, uh, specifically on the local watersheds that are so vital to Newland Gristmill and the surrounding community. Uh, so please join me in welcoming our speaker, Lauren McGrath, uh, who is the director of the Watershed Protection Program at the Willistown Conservation. All yours, Lauren. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, and thank you everyone for taking the time today uh, to come join this discussion. Um, so my name is Lauren McGrath and I work at Willistown Conservation Trust, uh, which is located just up the road in Chester County. Um, and at our heart, Willistown is a land protection organization, um, but truly what we aspire to do is connect people to the land and we do this in a number of different ways, um, primarily through our four different program areas. Um, so we have a habit, habitat stewardship program uh, where we work to maintain and improve our open space. Um, our community farm program, which has um, a focus on regenerative agriculture and connecting people to the landscape through food production. Our bird conservation program, um, which works to understand the health of migrating bird populations through our spring and fall migratory bird banding program, as well as through our participation in the MODIS radio telemetry project, um, where birds are fitted with radio backpacks um, that go off every time they pass by the series of towers that exist from Central and South America all the way up through Canada. And I'm here as a representative of the Watershed Protection Program, um, where we strive to understand the health of Ridley Crumb and Darby Creek waterways um, through our monitoring pro program. So there's plenty of volunteer and educational opportunities coming up in the future. Um, so if you would like to learn more, please visit our website at wctrust.org. But that's enough about Willistown. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you a little bit more um, about the topic at hand, which is watersheds. And this is a term that I've used several times now, and I'd like to formally introduce it so we're all on the same page. A watershed is the area of land that drains all of the landscape to a common outlet. So if you think about um, our stream ecosystems, or streams as um, the channel at the bottom of a bowl, anywhere that a raindrop falls within that bowl will wind up in that stream. And that stream will lead into a river and eventually to the ocean. Um, so this is really an important concept for today's discussion um, because a big part of what I'm trying to teach you today, and you may already be familiar with this idea, is what we do on the land directly impacts the water. Um, because of this watershed concept. So some synonyms that I, I'll be using interchangeably with watershed include drainage, basement, basin, and catchment. So let's think about what the watershed looks like or what the country looks like from a watershed point of view. So this is one of my absolute favorite maps. And this is the continental United States, but rather than be delineated by the 
state boundaries or county boundaries, we are delineating by watershed boundaries. So you can see that the bulk of the continent, the continental United States is actually made up of one watershed with over one third of the map being dominated by the Mississippi water or river basin. So with such a diversity of terrain contributing to this basin, it, it's helpful to break watersheds into sub watersheds. So the Mississippi River Basin has six sub basins, the Missouri, the upper Mississippi, the Ohio, which extends all the way into western Pennsylvania, the lower Mississippi, the Red River and the Arkansas White River basins. And by breaking the river into these six kind of I wouldn't call them bite-sized chunks, but smaller parcels, it's helpful to start to identify and work within those boundaries to help support healthy waterways. So to bring it a little more locally, I'd like to talk about the Chester Creek watershed. Um, and I didn't wanna to go too far into the talk without acknowledging that Chester Creek is the ancestral homeland of the Lenape Nation. Um, and my apologies because I don't speak Lenape, but the stream name before renaming by um, colonial settlers was the Michopanakan, um, which roughly translate to the stream along which large potatoes grow. Um, and I want to acknowledge this history of this landscape because uh, the Lenape were the uh, stewards of this land before colonial settlement. Um, and I give thanks to all of, all of the work that they've done and all of the lessons that we've been able to learn from the community that remains. But unfortunately, the Okahawking peoples who lived here uh, were displaced before a lot of their, um, a lot of the lessons that they had already learned about this countryside could be written down. So um, we give thanks to their ancestors. But the Chester Creek, as we know it, is broken into several smaller watersheds, including the East Branch Creek, uh, West Branch, and Main Stem Chester Creeks. And West Branch is where Newland Grist Mill is located. This watershed, although fairly small at only 67 square miles, is very important and very mighty. Um, it includes 20 municipalities, over 110,000 residents, and if you live in Chester Creek, there's a good chance that you're also drinking water that is originating in the Chester Creek watershed with 1.83 million gallons of drinking water being pulled from the creek every day. And it's really important to think about where our water comes from. If we live in the Delaware River Basin, which is where the Chester Creek drains to, um, because the Delaware River provides drinking water to over 15 million people, including residents of Camden, Philadelphia, Trenton, and even New York City. So maintaining a healthy landscape to preserve healthy watersheds is really critical because we rely on this river for our survival. So to break down a little bit, um, and I'm not a historian, I'm a biologist, but I did wanna to touch about um, into the human history of Chester Creek. And this is really focusing on the um, recent human history. So since colonization, um, development of the land began as early as 1644 in Chester Creek. Um, and that's the earliest date that I found um, with the development of tobacco farms in the lower watershed. Quickly after that first development came the construction of a number of important dams and mills starting as early as 1650. Um, these include paper, grist, lumber, cotton, tobacco, metal, and wool mills. Um, and to learn more about the amazing mill history, uh, you should visit Newland Grist Mill's incredible resources um, where you can learn a lot more about the really interesting and important history um, of this watershed through the mill lens. So if we jump ahead a couple of hundred years, um, the watershed um, has become quite developed quite quickly. Um, and so what is important to us as water researchers um, is this understanding of the concentration of impervious surfaces throughout the watershed. 
So an impervious surface is anything that does not allow water to pass through. So this can include asphalt parking lots, rooftops, or sidewalks, and in some cases, um, turf grass, including lawns, like um, on new developments where the soil has been packed down and lawns rolled out on top. Um, so where you have higher concentrations of impervious surfaces, you can have higher intensity impact from rainfall entering the stream. So this map that's shown on the right hand side of the screen is generated through Model My Watershed, which is an absolutely fascinating tool that was developed by Stroud Water Research Center. Um, and I would encourage you to go explore because you can delineate any watershed um, and see how the landscape has been altered within that, that space. So to break down this map, because there's a lot going on here, um, about 32.13% of the space within Chester Creek is considered developed open space. And this means that less than 20% of the total cover per parcel um, is impervious surface. So these tend to be spaces that are dominated by suburban development, a lot of lawns, um, and um, that's one of, it's the highest um, percentage of the landscape. So something that's really important to um, water quality is to understand how much impervious is too much impervious. Generally, the number um, tends to range between 10 and 20 percent. Impervious surface within a watershed can tilt you from healthy ecosystems to stressed ecosystems. Um, so seeing numbers uh, up in the 30s, even though it is, you know, per parcel less than 20% is an indicator that we might expect to see some degraded water quality throughout the watershed. Uh, low intensity development um, is at just over 15%, and that means it's a mixed construction material and vegetation landscape. So anywhere from 20 to 49% impervious surface per parcel. Medium intensity is 8.8, .8, and that is an impervious um, amount of about 50 to 79% per parcel. And then that dark red is developed high intensity, which is only 3.78% of the watershed. Um, but that is a highly developed landscape with 80 to 100% impervious. Um, so it makes sense when we're looking, seeing the concentrations of medium and high intensity landscapes are clustered around Westchester, Concordville, and Chester City. Um, so this makes sense. Um, if we think about what those landscapes look like, there are a lot of shopping centers and high intensity housing, um, parking garages, things like that. Um, so this um, map suggests that we should expect to see a fair amount of impact on some of the tributaries coming into uh, Chester Creek. But one of the most encouraging things from this map is actually the 23.98% deciduous forest cover uh, that, that exists within Chester Creek. So deciduous forests are really, really critical to helping improve water quality, especially during storms. Um, and what's wonderful on the map, it's sort of this kind of sage green color. And you can see that there's a high concentration along the creek itself. And that's really wonderful to see because those are trees that are growing in the riparian area. Um, and the riparian zone is really important for the watershed. And that's the section of stream um, from the bank to between 30 and 100 feet um, away from the stream. Oftentimes, these areas are we encourage them to be wooded because the trees provide a very critical suite of benefits to the water. So on our little diagram here, we can pretend that this is Chester Creek in our stream channel in the middle. And to the left, we have a suburban development, let's say. And to the right, we have some agriculture. And um, if we expect, um, there was unexpected clearing due to a storm surge like Hurricane Ida, and we lost our riparian buffers. What we would see is from our suburban area on the left, um, an influx of road salts potentially in the wintertime. 
detergents, and hot water at other points in the year. So road salts are a pretty nefarious contaminant um, of concern that is growing in, there are a lot, a lot of people growing more and more concerned with the amount of road salts um, entering the system during winter time. Um, salt can be very, very stressful when it enters our freshwater ecosystems. Um, detergents include uh, surfactants that come from our septic systems, from running our laundry um, and our dishwashers, and can interfere actually with fish's ability to maintain a healthy slime coating. Um, and if you think about the role of surfactants, which is to remove grease, it makes sense um, how it could be very stressful for a fish to swim through surfactant-rich uh, water. And hot water is a major contaminant of concern. Um, thermal pollution is a big issue, especially in headwater ecosystems, um, where the um, environment has evolved to all of the animals within the stream have evolved to live in cold groundwater fed streams. So during a hot summer day like today, when we have a storm and all of that rainfall is hitting hot water and running in or hot pavement and running into the stream, you can see a reduction in salt oxygen and an increase in very stressful um, stream conditions. From our agricultural landscape, we would see an increase in nutrients and pesticides and herbicides. So nutrients are concerning because they can lead to eutrophication, which is the rapid growth of unwanted algae and um, plant matter within a stream. And the issue isn't necessarily with those things growing, but when they die back, they can consume all of the oxygen within the system, leading to stressful, even deadly um, environmental conditions for many stream life. Pesticides and herbicides are just as effective in the water as they are in the landscape. And seeing as the base of our food chain within a stream ecosystem are insects, that can be a very big problem if we have direct deposition of um, pesticides um, and insecticides particularly entering the system. But if we go then and repair our tree planting, we replace all and allow to mature all of our riparian buffer. What we see is if everything else stays the same, the same amount of rainfall and the same contaminants entering from the ecosystem, the trees provide a break point and a filter. So as the water is coming off of the landscape, it's hitting these trees, it's slowing down. It's allowing the um, water to filter into the ground. The trees are picking up excess nutrients. The water is filtering through the soil down into the aquifer where it's cooling and becoming filtered and entering the stream now as groundwater rather than surface water. The trees also provide shade for the stream, reducing the amount of direct sunlight, which keeps the stream cooler. And the roots provide a stabilization for the stream channel. So when there are big storms and the water level does rise and the speed of the water moving through the channel increases, um, it holds those banks steady and reduces the amount of erosion. So riparian buffers are super critical. And I cheer every time I see maps like the one previous um, that show a strong and fairly continuous amount of riparian area along waterways. And the reason why we need to continue to focus um, on improving and increasing the amount of riparian areas and the ability of the landscape to absorb uh, stormwater is because all future predictions for the mid-Atlantic are suggesting an increase in rainfall in fewer storm events. So that means that we'll continue to have these isolated large storms where we get two to three inches of rain, um, but they'll be separated and discrete. And so the mid-Atlantic really has evolved to handle more regular storms of much smaller magnitude allowing for um, a slow soaking of the soil. Um, and so, you know, whatever we can do to reduce that impact um, of large storms uh, on our waterways is going to benefit everyone, particularly downstream communities. And I fully recognize that historic storms like Hurricane Ida 
um, they're are really hard to prepare for. I think Ida dropped something like seven inches of rain um, in less than six hours, which is about a month's worth of rain for August. And these can cause rapid habitat, habitat degradation and total loss um, of cer certain ecosystems. Um, so the mo more we can do to help keep our watersheds healthy between these large storms, the better off we will all be. So that's a little bit of a dire prediction. Um, but what's really beautiful is that there are so many groups working within our region to help improve all of these small watersheds that are overall turning into a net increase in the health of the larger Delaware watershed. Um, so I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the incredible wildlife that we've seen in Chester Creek. Um, and I'm going to start with, I think, one of the most exciting, but I know not everyone agrees with me, but freshwater mussels. So mussels are a really fascinating group of organisms. Um, and they are globally impaired with seven species being declared extinct in the United States last year alone. Um, so what's fantastic about Chester Creek is that there are still mussels pre present. Um, including the creeper or strange floater mussel, which was found by a survey uh, by the PA Fish and Boat Commission in 2018. Um, what's really even more exciting than the current presence is the work being done by the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary, um, who are working on breeding and reintroducing mussels back to their native range. Um, so in Chester Creek, that includes Elliptio complanata, the common Eastern Elliptio, and Paganodon cataracta, the eastern floater. Um, so mussels are some, have one of the weirdest life cycles um, and they actually rely on migratory fish to spawn. Um, so when mussels spawn, they time the release of their larval um, young called Glycidia uh, to align with the migration of freshwater eels. And so the Glycidia latch on for a day or two, up to a week, to the gills of the eel as the eel is moving upstream, and they drop off, and wherever they land is where they make themselves home. And so seeing as these are pretty sessile individuals, meaning they're not very mobile, um, they can continuously be washed downstream with each storm, um, but are able to repopulate upstream reaches. So if that's not cool enough, I'm going to share the life history of the American eel, which is present um, throughout Chester Creek, um, throughout the entire watershed, even though there are dams blocking the full migration of the eel. Um, this is an animal that should not be under, <laughs> undersold for their ability to bypass blockages. So eels are long lived fish. Um, this individual that was pulled out of Ridley Creek is probably somewhere between 20 and 30 years old. Um, and American eels have one of the most ridiculously fantastical migrations that's still shrouded in mystery. So eels breed in the Sargasso Sea somewhere. We're not really sure. No one's ever tracked down where their breeding habitat is but it's both American and European eels likely reconvene in the same breeding areas as they have for millennia. Um, the fact that both American and European eels are breeding in the same place suggests that they have been going through this um, migration since the continents were much closer together. And so when the eels spawn, they're, young called glass eels live in the ocean for about a year. And then they begin migrating up to headwater streams all the way throughout the Gulf of Mexico through Canada. And the males being a little less driven will stop in the estuaries, but the females will return all the way up to first and second order streams where they'll live up to 40 years before returning back to the Sargasso Sea to breed once. Um, so it's a really incredible journey, um, and these eels are wildly robust. Um, so you can see um, on the head of this eel, there are two, two marks here. We found her injured in Ridley Creek, 
I thought she was a bike tire. Um, and you can imagine my surprise when she coiled up around my arm and was in fact very much alive, not a bike tire at all. And um, she, we think had been injured by a heron or an eagle um, on her migration down to the Sargasso Sea. She's in her final form, um, an olive eel. Um, and we brought her in to, to show some students and then put her back. And I don't know if she completed her migration or if she was picked off by another lucky waiting predator. Um, but not to worry, eels are incredibly shy. They're nocturnal. Um, they won't be out slithering around your legs if you're um, enjoying a walk in the creek during a hot day. Um, the only way to really find them is to either go out at night when they're hunting or to um, use a backpack electroshocker. Um, and where they are present, they do a lot of really great work helping to control non-native crayfish species like the rusty crayfish and viral crayfish. Um, and they're just, I just think they're the cutest, but I understand that not everyone has an affinity for such slimy things. Um, so that brings us to our, my other favorite topic, insects. Um, so one of the most fantastic aspects of the work that I get to do is exploring the world of macroinvertebrates. So macroinvertebrates, are um, macro, large enough to be seen with the naked eye, and invertebrates, lacking a backbone. And these are um, primarily insects that we study, but it also includes bivalves and crustacea. Um, and these are insects that live all or part of their life uh, within the stream. So in this image here is a stonefly, um, a common stonefly, uh, which is a great indicator species um, for the health of water quality. So insects are a great way to connect people to the watershed because not only do they give us um, a good understanding of what's happening in the stream um, because they have a well-established relationship between the population of particular groups and water quality, but they're easy to find. So you don't need a backpack electroshocking um, unit, you can just go out in, you know, your wading shoes and look under rocks and see what's present. And there's an absolutely stunning amount of diversity within macroinvertebrates. Um, so there's some insects like this mayfly who are just beautifully adorned with wonderful fringe on those upper arms. Um, and this insect is called the Ligonuridae. Um, it sits with its arms up in like a T pose and captures snacks and food as it's flowing through the channel in that fringe and then feeds itself that way. Um, and then we have more common insects that you've definitely seen in their adult form. So on the left um, is a dragon hunter and on the right um, is a club tail dragonfly. And so even within individual groups, you can see that there's an amazing range of body types and adaptations to occupy every niche available within the waterway. So when we're assessing stream health, we look for the big three, the mayflies, stoneflies, or caddisflies, ephemeroptera, plecoptera, and trichoptera. And these are highly sensitive indicator species. So based on their presence or absence, you can use them basically like a canary in the coal mine. So if you have an abundance of your mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies, it's a pretty good sign that things have remained constantly um, in good condition for these animals over the course of their life, which can range between six months to about two years. However, if you return to a site and you see that you, don't, you no longer have any stoneflies, it can be an indication that something has changed. Um, more encouragingly, if you're doing restoration work and you start to see these animals reoccurring, then that's a great sign that conditions are improving. So this is um, a video that I took in Ridley Creek that showcases all of our big threes in abundance. So you can see these kind of like waddling bundles of sticks are actually crane flies who are closely related to butterflies, or not crane flies, sorry, caddisflies who are closely related to butterflies and moths. And they, like the three little pigs, will spin silk 
to build houses out of sticks, stones, and pieces of grass. Um, on the left here, you can see a mayfly, a flat-headed mayfly scuttling around. And on the right are some of my absolute favorite stream insects to see. They're called armored stoneflies. Um, and these guys really enjoy acidic waters where they'll thrive. Um, and so that should be an indication that we actually collected these just below um, an acidic wetland. So these insects can tell us so much about what's going on and they're just so sweet. So this is, sorry, it's a little blurry, but an image of one of those giant case-making caddis flies. Um, and so these you know, giants are very easy to find if you know where to look. And it's such a cool way to connect folks to the magic of what's happening in the watershed. A little more easy than trying to find eels or freshwater mussels. And if you're not keen on the whole insect vibe, then allow me to convince you their importance uh, through the lens of birds. So all chicks of all songbirds rely on insect protein. And it doesn't matter if you're a hummingbird, a sparrow, or a wren, all baby birds require protein to grow. The outlook for songbirds is not particularly encouraging right now. With habitat loss and changes in um, migration routes, really stressing populations that um, are, are struggling more than we would hope to see particularly last year's mystery disease um, caused a, a decline in a number of populations. So the more that we can do as stewards of the landscape to maintain healthy ecosystems for our streams and really provide a big base of protein by creating habitat for all of these stream insects, the better off we're going to be um, for our bird populations. Migratory birds align with the kind of traditional emergence of the adult forms of many stream insects, as well as the breeding season. So if we can get lots of insects pouring out of our streams each spring, we can hope to see healthier, more abundant babies um, of all of our cherished songbirds. But for truly the most charismatic, you can't argue with how sweet beavers are, at least, <laughs> at least when they're not in your backyard. Um, beavers should historically be present um, throughout Chester Creek. Uh, so before the onset of fur traders, beavers were one of the most abundant animals in our streams. Um, with estimates of beavers being present a full beaver colony every stream half mile throughout the continental United States. With fur trapping, that number has dropped precipitously, but over the last few years, uh, we have seen and documented beavers in Ridley, Crum, and Darby Creek, which suggests if they're not here already, they will likely be in Chester Creek at some point in the future. So be <clears throat> beavers, while not, um, traditionally welcomed in stream systems um, can actually provide a whole host of benefits for our waterways, including um, diversifying the amount of aquatic habitat for uh, fish and insects. And it feels counterintuitive, but increasing water quality. So uh, beaver ponds particularly do a host of different, um, play a host of different roles, including decreasing nutrients present within the stream um, and counterintuitively decreasing water temperature. There have been a number of papers that have come out recently suggesting that beaver ponds actually increase dramatically the amount of water infiltration into the soil beneath the pond. So the bulk of water movement is not actually over the dam but underneath it through the aquifer. And that water that is passing through the biofilm where nutrients are being reduced, it's being filtered and cooled much like through the riparian areas during storms. And then 
cooling off rapidly and re-entering the stream below the dam. So beavers are being considered throughout the country, especially out west, as a potential low-cost solution to climate change issues and water shortages. Um, so if you see a beaver uh, in Chester Creek, let us know because I just, I just think they're a delight. Um, and we're always looking uh, for different ways to, to study and understand their impact, particularly in suburban areas. So for non-webbed feet friends, how can we be good neighbors to Chester Creek? Um, there's a ton of different um, recommendations that I could give, but the biggest one is get to know your watershed. And a great way to do that is through volunteering or attending educational talks like today's. Um, donations are always welcome. There are so many different groups like Newland Grist Mill and Willistown Conservation Trust um, that are working to improve riparian areas and understand what's happening in the stream. The Chester Ridley Crumb Watershed Association does a ton of work within the Chester watershed and Stroud Water Research Center has tons of education opportunities and on the ground tree planting work. Um, so it's a great way to not only get to know your watershed, what the stresses are and where you can help make improvements, um, but it's a wonderful community of folks who are like-minded um, in the effort to improve overall health. Think natives. Um, if you have a yard and you're thinking about things to plant, I would encourage you to explore um, the incredible native plant community that exists within this part of the country. Even if you plant a small number of native plants, you can greatly improve the landscape's ability to infiltrate water into the soil. So that concept of getting water to soak back into the soil is so important. And when you have turf grass that grows really densely, um, it can act like an impervious surface. Um, so if you can break that up with, you know, one or two native plants that are beautiful and beneficial for pollinators, you can actually make a very big difference with very little effort. Plus, they have such robust root systems that you don't really need to water them that frequently and they don't require pesticides or fertilizers. Um, and they will attract tons of pollinators to your yard. And again, on the topic of lawns, um, turf grass is a really tricky plant, um, especially if you live in an HOA. Um, it can be a tough conversation to have, but um, the key to understand is that roots, the roots of these grasses grow to half the length of the blade. So if you're maintaining your yard at a tidy one inch, mowing it every week, that means the roots are only one half inch deep. And so in especially new developments where the soil has been compacted, um, it basically acts like concrete. So if you let the grass grow even a little bit longer, those roots have a chance to start to penetrate into the soil a little bit more and allow for a little bit more infiltration. So um, it's something to consider, um, but I know lawns are a very personal discussion. So um, one thing I would strongly suggest is if you are um, blessed to live next to a stream, don't mow all the way up to the water, water's edge. Um, I know the, one of the benefits of living next to a stream is having that beautiful view shed. So consider having strategically placed sections that you can clear while um, maintaining healthy uh, root systems, um, trees, native plants, along other sections um, to help reduce erosion. And then of course, whenever you're going anywhere, be sure to carry out what you carry in. Um, pick up litter when you see it and reduce the amount of garbage entering our stream ecosystems. Um, and one big tip, especially when we have storms like the one that is supposed to be rolling in tonight with strong winds is securing your trash and recycling cans. Um, Cause not only is it a pain in the neck to have to clean up in the morning if it gets knocked over and blown around, but oftentimes we don't get everything. Um, and one of the best ways to get to intimately know your stream is to participate in stream cleanups, um, which happen usually in the spring uh, when all of the uh, winter's accumulation of garbage becomes exposed. 
So I really want to thank you all so much for your time and attention today. Um, and I'd like to open the floor to any questions. I know I kind of rambled through a lot of inform information pretty quickly, um, but thank you all so much. And thank you, uh, Lauren, for that great presentation. Um, I thought we had found a really big uh, dragon hunter nymph, but the, the one in your photo looked like it was even bigger than the one we found, so I'm kind of jealous. <laughs> All right, if anybody has um, questions, I can let it so folks can unmute themselves and, or you, if you are more comfortable typing in the chat, thank you. Oh yeah, Adrian, you have a question? Thank you. Uh, very good presentation, by the way, that was very interesting. Um, my question has to do with the growth of excess algae and seaweed and all greens uh, in the waterway. And uh, from what I've read, and I've talked to Penn State University and everything, apparently a lot of it is due to excess um, nutrients getting into the water from fertilizers and everything, nitrogen, phosphorus, and so forth. Do you have any recommendations on how to deal with those? <laughs> yeah, eutrophication is a big, a big issue. Um, so I think one, the first biggest recommendation would be if you or anyone you know is applying fertilizer to the landscape, um, to be very careful about making sure to not, uh, not apply right before rainstorms because your whole investment just washes away. Um, but I mean, really one of the, the biggest ways to reduce it is by having actively growing plants along the stream's edge. Um, because the beautiful thing about fertilizers is that all plants want them. So if you can have a buffer of trees, shrubs, um, ideally native plants, but honestly anything that can pull up those nutrients before the water enters the stream, that would be ideal. Um, but it, it is really tricky um, because oftentimes it's not a point source um, contaminant. It's coming generally off the watershed wide spectrum. So it's hard to identify and reduce it at its source. Um, but I know a big recommendation I've made is if you live in the HOA, if you have a, a lawn management company that's working to talk to them about it, because oftentimes you're on a rotation and they're applying pesticides and you know fertilizers just whatever day your property is assigned to them. Um, so oftentimes, you know, they, they'll be open to having that discussion about adjusting the, the schedule. Um, so they're not putting fertilizer down 20 minutes before a thunderstorm comes through. Yeah. One of the things that I did look into was um, uh, treating the water with, uh, I guess there's some kind of pesticides that are being sold. And I don't like doing that because you're putting chemicals into the waterway and they even tell you to uh, be careful because of the fish and everything. So I didn't like that idea. But then I read that you can have an aerator, which basically oxygenates the water. And apparently that decreases the growth of some of these plants. Do you have an opinion on that? Aerators are awesome, especially if you have like a pond. Um, like yeah, I do. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I was thinking all about from the stream perspective, but yeah, in a pond, an aerator is absolutely wonderful. Um, okay. So it'll it'll help kind of disturb the water um, from a lot of the al that filamentous algae particularly doesn't like the water moving too quickly. Um, so it kind of pre prevents them from growing and encourages um, a biofilm to grow kind of along the bottom that will consume a lot of that like gnarly nitrogen, particularly. Okay. Um, and there are plants that you, emergent vegetation that you can plant that will consume nitrogen at a breakneck pace. Um, so certain things like cattails and a number of different reeds will um, 
And it's tricky because if they're consuming that nitrogen, that means they're growing probably pretty quickly. So that might open a whole can of worms. Um, but um, that's also worth exploring that combination of especially the native cattail, um, not the European cattail, um, does a really good job and provides habitat for all sorts of lovely um, insects, uh, particularly damselflies and dragonflies love living amongst those roots. Very good, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Great. Uh, anybody else have any questions? Great. Well, uh, thank you so much, Lauren, uh, for coming uh, to this uh, presenting today and uh, the folks who attended. Um, we have been recording, so we'll post it up on our website um, on the Newland series page. Um, you can also go to that section of our website to register for our next Newland series presentation. Uh, it's also going to be about water, but uh, with a little bit different focus, uh, more on the man-made water systems like the one that powers our mill. Um, so that will be on Thursday, August 11th at seven o'clock, uh, and our executive director, Tony Shahan, will be presenting that um, on turning water to power, how water systems work. Uh, so we learn how to keep it healthy um, and then we learn how to use it to grind grain and do all those other uh, things that mills do. Uh, so we hope to see everybody then. Uh, and again, thank you for uh, stopping on uh, this afternoon to join us. Thank you. All right, bye. Bye-bye.